you have your Bibles, you can open with me to Colossians chapter 1 and starting in verse 15. And if you haven't been with us for the past couple weeks, two weeks ago we started this series that we're calling Greater Than. And in this series what we're doing is we're going passage by passage through the book of Colossians starting at the beginning and we're going to be working our way all the way through until the end. And so um, today we're just continuing on in that series and just want to give a quick recap of some important things that we've talked about over the last few weeks. So the book of Colossians was written by a man by the name of Paul. And if you want to know more about Paul, I would encourage you to read your Bibles in the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells a lot about Paul's life. But basically, if we're going to sum it up, we could say that Paul was probably one of the greatest missionaries in all of church history and one of the greatest missionaries in the early church. And uh, Paul went to pretty much the entire known world at the time, spreading the gospel of Jesus, telling people people about who God is, who Jesus is, and what Jesus had done for them. And so Paul wrote this letter, and he wrote this letter from prison, because Paul was in prison in Rome because of his preaching the gospel, because of his ministry and what he was doing to try to share the faith with other people. And so Paul writes this letter from prison, and what prompted him to write this letter was a visit from a man by the name of Epaphras. And Epaphras was a man who earlier on had been heavily influenced in his faith by Paul. And so Epaphras hears that Paul is in prison. He comes to visit him, to encourage him. And and what's interesting about Epaphras is that Epaphras was a man, like I said, he had been heavily influenced by the Apostle Paul, and his hometown was Colossae. Now, Paul had probably never been to the church in Colossae. In fact, as we get on later in our series, we're going to read some passages where it kind of alludes to the fact that Paul probably hasn't been there before. So Paul had probably never been there before, but Epaphras comes and visits him. And Epaphras, his hometown being Colossae, Epaphras was the one who planted the church in Colossae for the first time. And so the gospel came to the church in Colossae, or to the people in Colossae the first time through this man named Epaphras. And so Epaphras comes and visits Paul, and he tells him about what God is doing in the church in Colossae. And uh, this is what, what prompts the whole letter. Epaphras tells Paul about people coming to Christ, about people coming to faith in Jesus at, in Colossae, but he also tells him about some of the challenges that they're facing. And in particular, one of the challenges was that Colossae was a city that had all different kinds of influences in it. There was all different kinds of religious ideas, all different kinds of spiritual uh, perspectives, all different kinds of worldviews and philosophies, and all of these kinds of things kind of would come together in Colossae. And one of the things that Epaphras had to tell Paul was that, was that the church, while, while there is people who had come to Christ, many of them, or at least some of them, were being influenced by all these other religious and spiritual ideas and, and philosophies and worldviews. And, and in all of that, they had taken all of these different things that they were hearing, and they'd kind of put them all together, and they came out with some ideas that weren't exactly Christian. They came out with some ideas that didn't exactly line up with what the true gospel was and with who Jesus really was. And and really at the at the base or the foundation of this was this was this taking away of the the centrality of who Jesus was. And so Paul writes this letter to the church in Colossae, most of whom he's never met before, maybe even all of them he's never met before to encourage them in their faith, but to challenge them not to be led astray by all these different ideas. Now, I don't know about you, but as I look at the world around us, I can see that there's all different kinds of ideas about religion and about spirituality and about all different kinds of of worldviews and thought processes and all different sort of ideas that are out there. And if we want to find and follow Jesus in our own lives, then we need to make sure that we know who Jesus really is. So the the title of today's message is Jesus is Greater. Jesus is Greater. And as as Paul gets into our passage for today, he's going to jump right into this. He started off in our first two sermons and the first two passages of Colossians with giving thanks to God for what he had done in the church in Colossae and by challenging them to live out their lives of faith, to allow the faith that had changed them inside to impact the way that they live their lives on the outside. But here, 
Paul's going to kind of get done with that prayer, and he's just going to jump right to it. He's going to get right to the central issue, and he's going to talk to us about who Jesus is. Now, if I were to ask a question to a lot of you, what do you think about Jesus? What kind of answers would you give me? People would say all kinds of different things. In fact, what I find interesting is that as you look at the world around us, most people will have a lot of really good things to say about Jesus. In fact, a lot of people who aren't even Christians or don't even try to follow Jesus will say a lot of good things about Jesus. You talk to people who come from different religions, people who come from different spiritual ideas, people who maybe claim no religion at all, and you ask them about Jesus, and most people will have a lot of positive things to say about Jesus. The question is, if everybody loves Jesus, everybody likes him and they have a lot of good things to say about him, then why aren't they following him? Why aren't they giving their lives to him in faith? And, and there's a lot of reasons we could talk about that, that might help us understand that a little bit. But one of the reasons I think that a lot of people don't follow Jesus in the way that the Bible would encourage us to is because they don't understand who Jesus really is. A lot of people would say things like, well, Jesus was a great teacher. And he was. But he was so much more than a great teacher. They'll say things like, Jesus was sort of this countercultural guy. He, he pushed up against and challenged sort of some of the religious ideas of his day. And he did. But he did so much more than that. And so there's all these positive ideas about Jesus, but who is he really? Because it's important for us to understand this because what you believe about Jesus changes everything. What you believe about Jesus changes everything. And as we get into this passage, I'm just going to warn you right from the start, Paul gets really deep really fast. He just dives right into some really deep theology and rich uh, doctrine about who Jesus is. And, and all of the reason for this is going back to the situation of the church in Colossae. These people had been been questioning all these different religions and all these different things and coming away with something that wasn't quite all the way Christian, even though it might have sounded good. And Paul wants to get right to the heart of the matter and say, I'm not going to speak necessarily against all of these different spiritualities or religions or things. I'm not going to tell you what's wrong with all of those things. Instead, I'm going to focus us on what is the foundation of Christianity on Jesus and so Paul starts off in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. He says, he, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now this is, this is an interesting start to this because if you're starting to, to try to say who is Jesus at his foundation, who is Jesus? And Paul starts here, he says, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. What is Paul trying to say here? What Paul is saying is that when we understand who Jesus is, we can understand who God the Father is. When we understand who Jesus is, we can understand who God the Father is. What, what Paul says here, this word image, is this idea that he's the exact likeness of, or in other words, when we see Jesus, we see who God the Father is. They're one and the same. The Bible talks to us about how we serve one God, but in that one God, we have three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we call in the church the doctrine of the Trinity. And let me tell you this morning, we could talk about the doctrine of the Trinity for all morning and for the next several years, and we would never be able to fully explain it. It's one of those mysteries that we know is revealed, revealed to us in Scripture, but it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. And you know, that really kind of makes sense because if God is really as big and great as we think he is, then we as humans probably will never be able to fully understand him. So Paul starts off, he says, he is the image of the invisible God. In, in other words, God is revealing himself to us through Jesus. God is revealing himself to us through Jesus. Sometimes people, when you talk to them and you ask them that question, what do you think about Jesus? They have a lot of great things to say about Jesus. But then when you say, what do you think about God? Or maybe you say the God of the Bible, and they might say, well, man, there's, there's a lot of stuff in there that seems, seems kind of hard or seems kind of seems strict or, or whatever. And they would, they would say, well, Jesus I like, but, but God, I, I'm not really sure how I feel about that. 
But Paul is trying to say you can't have one and not the other. Jesus is God. If you want to know who God is, then you look at Jesus because Jesus reveals to us who God is. In fact, Jesus said this to us himself. He said this when he was talking to his disciples one day and and one of his disciples, Philip, came up to him and he said, Jesus, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Show us who God the Father is. And Jesus responds in John chapter 14 and verse 9. He says, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me, or whoever has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? So when we look to Jesus, we see who God is. And this is a sticking point for a lot of people because a lot of people might say, Well, I like Jesus, but really at the end of the day, Jesus was a good man, he was a good teacher. But he wasn't a whole lot more than that. But Paul is saying, no, 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 no. The foundation of who we are as believers comes back to this fact that when we see Jesus, we understand who God is, that Jesus is God himself. And Paul starts right into it. He says he is the image of the invisible God. He calls him next the firstborn of all creation. Now I'll just tell you right now that a lot of churches and a lot of of religions go astray at this point. They'll use this passage of scripture to say things about Jesus that Paul never intended for them to be able to say. And it comes down to this idea of firstborn. Firstborn. Now, a lot of people will look at that and they will say, well, you know, Jesus must have been created by God. If he was firstborn, then he, he must have been created by God. That's, I mean, that's the idea that most of us think with firstborn, that, that we, had, we had a child and they were our firstborn. They, they weren't always existing. At some point, they came into existence. And to just tell you the truth, there's a lot of religions out there, a lot of spiritual ideas and things where people would talk about Jesus as a great man because they would look at a verse like this and say, well, Jesus must have been created. But What we have to go back to is where Paul starts. He says he is the image of the invisible God, meaning he is God himself. He is everything that's true about God is true about Jesus. Everything that's true about God is true about Jesus. And so if God the Father is eternal, then Jesus has to be eternal, meaning he was never created. He's always existed So this idea of firstborn doesn't necessarily mean that he came into existence. In fact, oftentimes in the Bible, people would use this word firstborn to talk about not not necessarily specifically or literally a firstborn child, but to talk about someone's status as the highest in the family or the highest of the group. To talk about someone's status as being above everybody else. Now, how do we know that? Let's turn, if you will, with me to Psalm chapter 89 and verse 27. This gives us a perfect example of this. This passage talks of David, all right? And and the psalmist, this is God speaking, saying, and I will make him, David, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So what's happening here? Was David the oldest in his family? No, we know that he wasn't. If you go back in the Bible to the book of Samuel, you know that David had several older brothers. So you can't just go back in time and all of a sudden make David the firstborn. What he's trying to say here, when he says, I will make him the firstborn, that next phrase, the highest, describes what they mean by saying firstborn. So Jesus, going back to our passage in Colossians, when it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It's saying he is the highest of all, the greatest of all, greater than all creation. Now, I told you this gets really theological and really deep really fast. So you might be saying, you're saying a lot of things to me, but where does this really hit me where I'm living today? And it's a great question. Because where we started a few moments ago, we said what you believe about Jesus changes everything. Everything. 
And let me tell you this morning that if you understand that when we see Jesus, we see God revealing himself to us, that when we see Jesus, he wasn't just another man, he wasn't just a great person, but he was God himself, and that as God, he is higher and greater than all of creation, that kind of tells us something about what our relationship with him should look like. It kind of tells us that when there's these other ideas or philosophies or spiritualities that come at us in our culture today, that if they take away something about who Jesus is, if they try to say that Jesus is anything less than God or anything less than greater than all of creation, then then they're led astray. We don't want to listen to those things. We don't want to be led astray from what Scripture tells us. This is an important thing for us to understand. We have to know who Jesus is because the reason we call ourselves Christians is because Christ is the foundation of who we are, the foundation of our faith. So Paul says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He continues on in verse 16 and 17. He says, For by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What we see here is this reality that Jesus created all things and thus He is greater than all things. Jesus created all things, and thus, he is greater than all things. Think about this. If if you were to go to your garage and build something, to to make some sort of creation, some sort of invention, or, or build something, all right, which is greater, the thing that you built or the one who thought it up and knew how to build it? It's, it's, when you think about it in those terms, it makes a lot of sense. The person who knew how to build whatever that thing was, the person who knew how to put it together is, is greater than the thing itself. In other words, the creator is greater than the creation. The creator is greater than the creation. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. He's saying that Jesus is God himself, that when we see Jesus, we understand who God is, that through Jesus, we see God, God revealed to us, and that he's greater than all things because he created all things. You go back to the beginning in Genesis, it talks about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and what Paul is telling us is that Jesus was right there in the midst of that. That Jesus didn't just show up on the scene later at some point, but he was right in the midst of that. He says that he created all things in heaven and on earth. That's interesting. Visible or invisible. It says whether, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, he created all things. Paul lists all kinds of lofty, high authority type things. Thrones, dominions, authorities, rulers. He says, Jesus created all of those things, and thus he's greater than all of those things. So whatever high authority that you might look to, Jesus created that authority, and he's got more authority than even that. That, This is what Paul is trying to get to. He's trying to, if you see this, he's trying to, to, to look at who Jesus is and lift him up, put him in his rightful place, help people understand who Jesus really is, So that when they understand how great and how amazing uh, that he is, they can see clearly what it means to be a Christ follower. That being a Christ follower means that he is central because of who he is. It says whether, whether in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible. This is interesting because, you know, there's a lot of things that are out there in the spiritual world, right? There's a lot of things that exist that we can't see. The Bible talks about angels and demons, and and we we know that there's a whole spiritual realm of things, that that Satan is real, that that there's a God in heaven, we can't see him, all of these things, that, that this is telling us that everything that was created, whether we can see it or not, Jesus created all of it. 
And he is Lord over all of it. He is ruler over all of it. So, you know, I know that, that sometimes, depending on your background and depending on the culture you come from and things like that, that sometimes you may have had some, some spiritual experiences, some spiritual experiences, and sometimes those can be, they can sound really good. It's like, yeah, it was a really positive thing, but let me tell you, if Jesus wasn't the center of that, then it's lacking, If Jesus wasn't the center of that, then the focus was in the wrong place. On the other side of that, you can have spiritual experiences and people have that can scare them a lot because of the reality of evil and darkness in the world, because of realities of demonic activity in the world. And let me tell you today, you don't have to be afraid when you are a believer and you've given your life to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is greater than any power that's out there. He's greater. Why? Because he's the one who created it in the first place. Jesus is greater than all of creation. He created all things and thus... He is greater than all things. Again, I understand this is a lot of heavy theology that we're talking about here, so just give me a few more moments and we'll kind of bring it home. Paul says, starting in verse 18, it says, and, so in addition to this, or or you could even say, because of all this, or built on the foundation of all that we've just said about Jesus, that he's God revealed to us, that he is eternal, that he's greater than all of creation, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. There's another reference to Jesus being God himself, that all the fullness of God was in Jesus. And verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What this tells us here is that Jesus created all things. He's higher than all things. But in that, in all of those realities, there comes this central truth that starts to stick out. That Jesus is great and as amazing and as high and as as exalted as he is, that Jesus came to this earth because he wanted to have relationship with the people that he created. He is the head of the body, the church. These are, these are the Bible's ways of talking about the people of God. The body of Christ, the, the church, are the people of God. They're, they're the people who understand that, that on their own, they can never have relationship with God. They can never have, have right relationship with God. And, be, and through Jesus, they can come into a place where their sins can be forgiven and they can walk in connection with God for the rest of the days of their life and into all of eternity. And who's the head of that? Jesus is the head of that. He's the head of the body, the church. It says he's, he's the firstborn from the dead. Remember, this, this word firstborn doesn't mean he's created or he's the first one or anything like that. It means he's greater than, he's, he's higher than all of the dead. What, what he's saying here, this is a reference to his resurrection. Jesus was the first and only person up to that time period who was resurrected bodily and never died again. Right, We can go back in the Bible and we can say, well, Jesus, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life, right? But Lazarus, last time I checked, isn't still running around Israel somewhere. <laughs> Jesus was the first and only person to raise to life in his body and raise to eternal life, never to die again. And in him... He was the firstborn, the the supreme one over all of that. But in that idea of firstborn there in this context is this idea he was the first of many more to come. Who else was going to be resurrected but all of those who gave themselves to relationship with Jesus? He's the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the center of who we are. And in him, we have eternal hope. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, again, a reference to the fact that he's fully God, and then verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is where it hits home. That, you know, I I don't know what your background is. I, I don't know exactly where you've been, the story of your life, 
But what I do know is that all of us have a story to our life. All of us have things that we've been through and situations and circumstances that we've faced, and, and we all have a story. But what Paul is telling us here is that without Jesus, people would have no hope for relationship with God. Without Jesus, people would have no hope for relationship with God. That Jesus, this great, amazing God that, that he's talked about, who's eternal and, and he's, he's created all things, he's the one that said, I want to be in relationship with the people that I created. And I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your past is. But here's what I do know. The Bible tells us that every person is guilty of sin. And a lot of times we think of sin as things that we do that God wouldn't like, all right? Now that's true. Sin is things that we do that God wouldn't like. But sin goes much deeper than that in us. Because if, it's, if all it was was, well, I just need to stop doing the things that God wouldn't like, is anybody capable of that in their lives? Sin has such a deep hold on us that it holds us in slavery that we can never free ourselves from. But Jesus says, no matter what your past, no matter, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what sin has characterized your life, Jesus is greater. And if he created all things, if he created the heavens and the earth, the seen and the unseen things, if he is God himself and he says, I want to be in relationship with my people, I want to free them from the slavery and darkness of sin and set them free to relationship with God, then he and he alone is able to do it. And that's exactly what he did on the cross for us. That Jesus came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, he died a death that he didn't deserve. Why? So that he could pay the penalty for your sins and mine. You know, a lot of times when I talk to people about faith and about spirituality and people who, who aren't connected to a church, a lot of times they'll say things like, well, you know, I just, I need to get my life together and then I'm going to come back to church. You know what? If, if we all wait till we get our lives back together to come back to church, to come back into a relationship with God, we'll never be be in relationship with God. It'll never happen. Every single one of us has fallen short of what God has for us. Every single person. But the good news, and this is what we talked about two weeks ago when Paul is giving thanks, the good news of the gospel, the sure hope that we have is that Jesus was greater than the sin in our lives. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made, what sins you've committed, the ways that you've lived your life in rebellion against God. It doesn't matter because through Jesus, he can forgive you of those sins and he can give you new life. He can give you new life. Now, like I said, this passage is a lot of heavy theology. There are books and books and books written about these kinds of things. And so I understand that a lot of this stuff is really kind of these big ideas that are, that are really hard to wrap our minds around. Honestly, we could, we could dive into this for weeks and weeks and weeks. But the crux of all of it, the, the foundation, the, the main point of all of it, and, and again, think of Paul's situation. He's writing to a church who's who's mixed together all these ideas from a culture that says, well, you can add this and that, and you know, Jesus is great, but you know, there's these other things that are great too. Paul is writing to them and he's saying, you know what? Anything that takes away from who Jesus is is not what God has for us. And that's what I want to challenge you with today. What do you have in your life that would take away from who Jesus is? Not Jesus as the world would define him, but Jesus as Paul define, defines him here in verses 15 through 20. What do you have in your life that would take away or try to lessen or try to downplay who Jesus is? Is it somebody else's ideas or somebody else's influence? Is it, is it a certain relationship? Is it, is it a certain lifestyle? Is it a certain activity that you like to do? Is it, is it something that maybe in itself isn't even necessarily bad, but you just allow it to take more importance than Jesus? What is there in your life that would lessen the importance or try to downplay who Jesus is? 
And that's right where God wants to meet you. Jesus says, I came to bring healing to that area. I came to bring wholeness to that area, not to just cast you aside because you didn't get it perfectly, but to, but to come right into those places of brokenness in your life and speak life and healing. You see, when we understand Jesus in this way, the way that Paul talks about here, the only res appropriate response to Jesus is to give him our worship and devotion. The only appropriate response to Jesus is is to give him your worship and devotion. And that's exactly what this passage would call us to today, and that's exactly what I want to call each one of us to today. You know, I don't know everybody's story. I, I said that earlier. I don't know where you're at spiritually. If you were to stop and say, if I had to define my relationship with God right now, this is how I would define it. I don't know how everybody in this room would answer that question. Are you far from God? Are you closer to him than you've ever been? Are you somewhere in between? Are you confused about who he is? Do you desire to know him more deeply? What, how would you define your relationship with God? I don't know the answer to that question for every one of you. But what I do know is this. No matter where you are in the journey of faith, Jesus wants to meet you there. And he wants to bring you closer. Jesus wants to meet you there and he wants to bring you closer. And so I'm going to ask everybody this morning, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. And the worship team is going to prepare to lead us in worship here in just a few moments. But as they do that, I want to ask you to, to really consider that question in your life. How would you define your relationship with God right now? How would you define your relationship with Jesus? And then the other question I asked, what is there in your life that tries to take away from the centrality, from the, from the huge reality of who Jesus is as Paul reveals to us in this passage? And this morning, I want to just ask you if you'll give God a chance to meet you in those places. If you'll just invite him into your life to meet you in that place. This morning, maybe you've followed Jesus in your life and you find yourself in a place where, where for whatever reason you just say, I, I feel like he's distant. I feel like he's far away. I love, I've, I've loved him in my life. I've followed him. But, but right now it just seems like there's no connection. Jesus wants to meet you in that place. If you're here this morning and you say, man, I, I feel as close to God as I've ever been in my life. I, everything's Everything in my life, as I look at my spiritual journey, I, I, just, I just sense God so much more than I ever have. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to meet you in that place. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you say, I've never really had a relationship with God. For whatever reason, that might be. But you recognize that that you've never really lived your life in relationship with God. And, and this morning, I want to tell you, Jesus wants to meet you in that place as well. And no matter where you are, he wants to meet you with grace and with love and with mercy and with no condemnation because he came that he could set you free from the power of sin and give you new life in Christ. So this morning, what I want to do as you think about that, as you answer those questions in your own life, I want to encourage you to respond to God wherever you find yourself today. If you're far from him, this is a moment to recommit your life to him. If you've never had a relationship with him, today you can start one. You don't need me to lead you in a prayer to start a relationship with Jesus because I don't have any power to give you a relationship with Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. All you need to do is turn to him and say, Jesus, I love you. I want you in my life. I want everything that you have for me. Come in, forgive me of my sins and, and be the leader of my life from this moment forward. So if, if you've never had a relationship with God, in the moments ahead, you can, you can make that step and make that commitment to having a relationship with God by simply doing that. Or maybe this morning you say, man, everything is great in my relationship with God. Let me tell you, God has more for you. Keep pursuing him and he will meet you in that area.
the worship team is going to lead us in a song. And as they do, I want to encourage you to respond whatever way is best for you. You can stand and sing. You can kneel at your chair, whatever that looks like for you. But for a few moments, how can we read a passage like this that lifts up and is all about exalting who Jesus is? How can we read a passage like this and not end our service in doing the same thing? And so the worship team is going to lead us in a song to do just that. And as they do, I want to encourage you to respond however you feel like God wants you to respond. Stand, sit, kneel, sing, pray, whatever that looks like for you, but respond to what God is doing in your life in this moment and see him meet you right where you are in your spiritual journey and take you farther with him than you've ever been before. Hallelujah. We serve an amazing Jesus who is higher than everything else. And let me tell you this morning, that if Jesus is as great as Paul told us today in Colossians, as really as God told us today through Paul in the book of Colossians, if Jesus is as great as the song that we just sang declares that he is, then no matter what's going on in your life, he is greater than all of it. Whatever challenges you're facing, Jesus is greater. That doesn't lessen the fact that they may be difficult or that there may be hardships, but it tells you that in it, Jesus is greater and that you can trust in him to lead you and guide you through it and that in the end, Jesus wins. No matter what situations or circumstances, no matter what challenges you're facing this morning, Jesus is greater. So I wanna challenge you today as we just take a moment to close in prayer here, to ask yourself those questions one more time. How would I define my relationship with God? And number two, what is it in my life that takes away from who Jesus is? And as we pray and close in prayer today, I want you to lift those things to God and invite him to meet you right in the middle of it. Lord Jesus, We thank you because you are a great and amazing God, higher than all creation. God, you are so high and exalted. You are God himself. And Jesus, you are the foundation of our faith. And so today, we just want to lift you up. We want to praise you and glorify you. And we want to honor you today and give you your rightful place in our lives as greater than all. Lord, I pray for each person, whatever challenges or situations they're facing today, God, I pray that you would meet them in those things, that you would remind them that you are greater than all of those challenges, that though they may struggle, though there may be hardships and difficulties in life, that they can lean into your strength and and have you sustain them, Lord. God, for, for those people who would be here this morning who would say, You know, I I just don't really know what it's like to walk with God in my life, to have a close relationship with him, that God, they can lean into Jesus and they can find that for their lives. God, wherever, wherever we're at, we just invite you into those areas and we ask you to take your rightful place as greater than all. And this morning, God, we pray that if there are areas in our lives that would try to take away from the the truth and the power of who you are, that God, we would just submit those things to you today. Whatever it might be, a relationship, a a possession we have, a a, a level of success we might try to pursue, whether it's even our our own stubbornness or our own pride, whatever it is, God, we submit it to you and we ask you to be greater than all in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning in New Life. I want to challenge you as you go throughout this week. Go lifting Jesus high above everything that you face. Go in the grace of God, and we'll see you next week.